Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Tribedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. Uh, Let us discuss how to isolate the plasmids from the bacterial cell. So, the first step is that you have, you have to transform the plasmids into the bacterial cell, let them to grow for overnight so that they will have the OD of 0.8 to 1. Now, if you take the 0.8 to 1 OD bacteria, but in the first step what you have to do is you do the centrifugation and collect the bacterial cells ok and then uh, so each bacterial cell will contain the mostly the three components one is the chromosomal DNA which is actually the, uh, the, uh, the genome of the particular E. coli which you are using for as a host then it is going to contain the plasmid DNA which you have to isolate and then it also going to contain the lipids as well as the protein part. So, now you what your purpose of this isolation is that you have to get the plasmid DNA and you have to destroy the chromosomal DNA as well as the cellular protein. So, for first step is that you resuspend this into a resuspension buffer which is actually the 50 millimolar glucose, 25 millimolar tris SCL pH 8 and 10 millimolar EDTA pH 8 and that actually will resuspend the bacterial cell containing the plasmid into, uh, into the isotonic conditions. Then in the second step what you do is you lyse the bacterial cell under the, uh, under the strong lysis uh, conditions. So, what you do is you add the uh, uh, the uh, resuspension buffer where the cells are responded you add the lysis buffer solution number 2 which contains the 0.2 normal NaOH and 1 percent SDS that actually will lyse the bacterial cell and it will going to not only that it is also going to denature the chromosomal DNA as well as the plasmid DNA. You, if you remember we have discussed in the past that the chromosome, the DNA is very very sensitive for alkali uh, conditions. So, once you add the alkaline, alkali to the, uh, uh, the bacterial cell uh, and as well as the SDS, so SDS is going to lyse the bacterial cell and the alkali what you have added is going to denature the chromosomal DNA as well as the plasmid DNA. In the step 3, what you do is you renature these uh, biological molecules. So, in the step 3, you will do the renaturation as well as the centrifugations. So, in the step 3, what you do is you will, you will add the renaturation buffer or you will add the solution 3, which actually contains the acetate, potassium acetate, glacial acetic acid. So, what will happen is because these contains NaOH, which is actually the alkali and this contains the acid which is actually the, uh, uh, the potassium acetate as well as the gaseous acetic acid. The acid is going to neutralize the alkali and because of that it actually going to renature the DNA. But the problem is that the chromosomal DNA is going to be very very big. Uh, compared to the plasmid. So, the time what you are providing for renaturation is only very short, maybe like uh, uh, half a minute or one minute. So, in that short period of time, the renaturation will only going to occur for the plasmid DNA, not for the chromosomal DNA. So, because of that, uh, the chromosomal DNA is going to be denatured or is going to be remain as denatured and then when you centrifuge, what will happen is the chromosomal DNA will present into the precipitate whereas, the top portion is going to contain two component, one is the plasmid, the other one is called as the protein which is also still present. 
So, after this your next task is to remove the protein part so that you are going to have the free plasmids. So, in the step 4 you will do the deprotonation. How you do the deprotonation is that you are going to treat the uh, solution with the chloroform uh, phenol mixture. The chloroform phenol mixture when you treat then uh, what will happen is that will remove the protein in the form of precipitate. So, this actually is going to precipitate the protein whereas, your plasmid is going to be present in the aqueous phase which is present into the top layer. So, when you will do that actually into the up and off what will happen is you are going to have the protein at the bottom whereas, the plasmid is going to be present in the solution. Now, what you have to do is put your tip or put your pipette and suck this particular liquid into the next vessel and then you have the plasmid into the solution. Now, into the step 5 you will add the alcohol and once you add the 100 percent alcohol the plasmid is going to be precipitated in the form of the white color pellet and that you can resuspend with the help of the water or the TE which is called this EDTA solution and that is how you are going to get the plasmids. So, the way the theoretically I have shown you the plasmid isolation the similarly the plasmid isolation has also when you when you perform the plasmid isolation in your laboratory or in your institution you are going to face many technical difficulties to tower to, to overcome this uh, particular thing what we have done is we have also demonstrated you with a, a small clip from my lab where the, my student has shown the, or demonstrated how to isolate the plasmid from the bacteri transformed bacterial cell and what are the different types of precaution you should take while you are isolating the plasmid from the bacterial cell. In this video, we will be demonstrating how to isolate plasmid using manual method and how to extract the plasmid DNA using phenyl chloroform extraction method or isoprobenol method. Both the methods will be uh, demonstrating in this video and also we will show uh, how to analyze the results like uh, what are the different bands you will get after plasmid uh, running analyzing a gel. Hello everyone, in this video we will show you how to isolate plasmid DNA using alkaline lysis method. For preparation of plasmid DNA we need resuspension buffer, lysis buffer and neutralization buffer. In addition to that we need isopropanol, RNAs and ethanol. Resuspension buffer contains 25 millimolar tris and 10 millimolar EDTA and we have to add RNAs at a final concentration of 100 microgram per ml. Lysis buffer contains 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide and 1 percentage STS. Neutralization buffer contains 3 molar potassium estate H6.0. For isolation of plasmid DNA, we need at least overnight grown culture with OD of 3.0. So, this is already a cultured one. We have to harvest the cells by centrifugation. These files we have to centrifuge 
11,000 RPM for at least one minute to get the cells precipitated. Now we got the cell pellet. We can proceed for alkaline lysis method to isolate plasmid DNA. In first step, we are going to add resuspension buffer which contains RNA -Z. mix thoroughly until all the cells suspended in resuspension solution. After the cells got suspended completely, now we have to lyse the cells using strong alkaline condition that is 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide and also 1% sodium dodehyl sulfide. Now we have to gently flip the tube in order to light the cells completely. We can keep in this condition for up to 5 minutes but not more than 5 minutes which will degrade the plasmid DNA and also genomic DNA will come out and it will interfere with the mini -print. In next step, we have to neutralize the sodium hydroxide using neutralization buffer to prevent any further degradation. After adding neutralization buffer, you can see there is a white precipitate. That means all the proteins precipitated by neutralization buffer. You can flip the tube two three times, completely precipitate all the remaining proteins. Now the solution contains solution part contains our plasmid DNA and the, all the precipitated one contains genomic DNA and also the proteins from bacteria. Now 
we have to centrifuge this lysate for 10 minutes at 11,000 G. precipitate got settled. Now we have to transfer the white clear supernated to another tube. This clear supernatant contains plasmid DNA. Now we have to precipitate this plasmid DNA with the isopropanol followed by washing with the 70% ether. We can see white precipitate in the solution. Now we have to centrifuge it, collect the, the white precipitate and wash with the 70%. After precipitating plasmid DNA with the isopropanol, we will get a pellet of plasmid DNA. Now we have to wash that pellet. We wash this pellet with the 70% ethanol. Again, centrifuge the pellet. Now we got the pellet, we have to air dry the pellet and dissolve it in deionized water or TE buffer. We will keep leave at room temperature till the till the ethanol got evaporated. Next we will add tea. To easy the process of manual alkaline lysis method, there are several kits available from commercial vendors. The basic difference between alkaline lysis method and the kit based method is, kit based method contains silica based columns where lysis lysate which containing plasmid DNA binds through these beads and after washing whatever the unwanted components are they will elute out and we will elute 
the plasmid DNA in tea buffer or water. The composition of the lysis buffer is same as previous uh, method. And also neutralization buffer, resistance buffer, every buffer contains same composition. But in commercial kits, we have one extra wash buffer which will remove any unwanted contamination and give pure DNA. Now, uh, once you isolate plasmids, what you will see is you will see a typical plasmids will give you the three different types of DNA and this is what is another one. Okay. So, what you have is one DNA, another DNA and the third DNA and if you do not do the uh, resuspension or if you do not do the RNA treatment properly, you will also going to see the RNA. So, this is the RNA what you are going to see if the RNA is what you have added in the resuspension buffer is either not working or you have not uh, performed that particular step properly. Apart from that, you are going to see the covalently closed circular model, covalently closed circles, you are going to see open circle and as well as you are going to close see the uh, open super coiled DNA, you are going to see all the three forms of plasmids into the agros gel when it you when you analyze these plasmids from the uh, bacterial cell and uh, so this is all about the bacterial plasmid which we have discussed so far now we'll move on to the other uh, types of vector which we are which we uh, which we ha are going to discuss so the other vector uh, what we are have to discuss is the yeast vector, phage vector as well as the mammalian vector. All these vector as we said in the beginning itself are the eukaryotic vectors which means these vectors are going to uh, can be used for tra transfecting the eukaryotic cells. Uh, in the case of eukaryotic vectors, you could have the vector of two different types the vector which are as a extra chromosomal DNA which means the vector which could work as a plasmids which will replicate along with the host strain and as a extra chromosomal DNA or you could have the integrating vector where the when the when you put the vector into the host cell it will integrate within the genome of that particular host cell and that is how when the host cell is going to produce or will going to make the copy of its own host uh, or it is uh, make going to make the copy of its genome then it is also going to carry forward which means either it is going to be as a as a plasmid which is means it, uh, 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 it, it will be you going to have a vector which is extra chromosomal DNA. So, that actually is going to be the vector which you use always for the transient expression whereas, the integrating vectors which you are going to use for the permanent expression which because integrating vectors are going to integrate your foreign DNA into the chromosomal DNA of the host cell and because of that it actually going to completely change the host cell and host cell will replicate along with that the foreign DNA is also going to replicate. This means uh, with the integrative plasmids you are going to generate the permanently transfected uh, organisms whereas if the vector is present as the extra chromosomal DNA it will let you to produce the modified organism but that will be the transiently expressing your gene. So, let us start with the yeast eukaryotic plasmids from the yeast in the eukaryotic system from the yeast has the a similar kind of feature such as the it contains the multiple cloning sites, it could be shuttle vectors which means uh, it is going to have the origin of replication for E. coli and the yeast and 
it also going to have the selection markers. So, most of the eukaryotic uh, vectors are actually containing the uh, origin of replications for the bacterial system which means E. coli as well as for their own host strain and that actually important because most of the molecular biology manipulation before you test these vectors into their original host strain, you actually try to do the molecular biology manipulations into the bacteria because the bacterial manipulation or the transformation into the bacterial cell as well as the molecular cloning related steps are much easier in performing into the E. coli compared to the original host strains. That is one advantage. The other one is that the E. coli life cycle or the E. coli doubling time is less. So, whatever the procedure you will do in E. coli is going to be faster compared to the yeast or the other host strains. So, you have three different types of the yeast vectors. Number one is called as the episomal vectors. Uh, episomal vectors, the yeast episomal vectors are constructed by combining the bacterial plasmids either with the yeast 2 micron uh, origin of replication or with autonomous replicating sequences. Uh, so, either of these will be combined with the bacterial plasmids and that actually gives the yeast episomal vector. One of the classical example of the yeast episomal vector is the YEP24 and the YEP24 is a 2 micron uh, yeast based episomal vector. It is actually a 6.3 kilo base pair plasmid with a copy number in the range of 50 to 100 and these plasmids are uh, since these are the 2 micron origin of replications, uh, these plasmids are much more stable compared to the plasmids which are being derived from the autonomous replicating sequences. Uh, now, the other one is the integrating vectors. These integrating vector as I said, integrating vector will let you to integrate that particular foreign DNA into the host genome. So, in the yeast, the integration occurs by homologous recombinations and in yeast, the integrating vector contains the target sequences for integration into the chromosomal DNA, selection markers and the bacterial origin of replications as well as it will contains the yeast replication activator. Uh, before you, uh, so these are the circular plasmids, okay. But before you put them into the host uh, or for the delivery of these particular uh, integrating vectors into the yeast, it is digested with the unique restriction endonuclease to produce the linear DNA to increase the transformation efficiency as well as the integration. So, what will happen is you cut with the restriction enzyme that is how you are going to create the linear DNA and that linear DNA you will transform into the yeast because the linear DNA will have the exposed uh, homologous sequences and that actually will allow its efficiency into the integrating into the genome. In most of the cases, the integration is done in such a way that the yeast chromosomal DNA remain intact and integration may not affect the yeast growth. So, this is very important that when you do the integration of any foreign gene into the host chromosome, you should ensure that it should integrate into the region which should not affect the growth or the viability of the host strain because if that happens, then the corresponding host strain may not survive and it will be going to be a lethal uh, integrations or the homologous combinations. Uh, in an alternate approach, uh, a portion of the yeast chromosomal DNA is replaced with the vector DNA through homologous recombinations. These vectors are known as the transplant integration vector uh, and they have the foreign DNA selection marker and so these are the different category of the integration vector where what you will do is you will also going to have the cassettes for the host as well and the host will, uh, so in that case what will happen is when the integration vector is going to pre, uh, insert the DNA along with its cassette, you are also going to provide the essential genes so that the yeast is also not going to be affected by doing this particular type of homologous recombinations. 
Now the third category is called as the yeast artificial chromosome. So yeast artificial chromosome, if you remember the yeast artificial chromosome is the choice of the vector for producing the, uh, the genomic library. So human genomic library is being produced within the yeast artificial chromosomal system because they can actually take up very large DNA approximately up to 100 kilo base pair DNA and that is why they are the most preferred vector for preparing the genomic library. Uh, YAC vectors are just like a chromosomal uh, chromosomes because it contains the ARS sequences, centromere sequences and the telomere at the two ends to give the stability. It has an ampicillin resistance gene. So you can see that it has the ampicillin resistance gene. Uh, and it also uh, for selection in E. coli whereas it has the uh, E. coli original replication for propagation in bacteria. So these are also called as the shuttle, uh, you, uh, shuttle plasmids because they are also going to have the original replication for the yeast as well. Uh, for cloning uh, the yak is digested with a particular combination of SMA1 and BAMH1. So, for if uh, you once you, you want to use them for the cloning purposes, what you have to do is digest this particular plasmid with SMA1 and BAMH1 and alkaline phosphatase. Once you do this type of treatment, what will happen is the plasmid is going to be linearized and it also going to create a space which is actually going to have the space where you can actually put the foreign DNA and uh, the foreign DNA you will put along with the ligation reaction. So, the foreign DNA is going to get ligated. Now, what you do is you put this particular, particular recombinant DNA into the selection marker. So, in the case of uh, the YAC plasmids, what you have is you have the two genes which you can use for selection. One is called URA3, the other one is called as the TRIP1. So, URA3 is for the uh, uh, will allow you to uh, for the uracil biosynthesis pathway and uh, whereas the uh, trip 1 is for the tryptophan uh, for the tryptophan biosynthesis so you can use either of these depending on the place where you want to use so what you have to do is because once you disrupt these genes the the resulting recombinant dna will not be able to perform will not going to provide these enzymes which are required either for the tryptophan biosynthesis or the for the uracil biosynthesis so you have to grow these uh, yeast on the uracil or the tryptophan deficient uh, uh, deficient media and because the uh, the plasmid contains the tryptophan or the uracil gene so they will be able to grow if the plas if the if they will get transformed whereas uh, whereas uh, the non transformed e coli will not be able to grow in the uracil or the in the absence of uracil or the tryptophan so uh, these are the two gene which are present on to the particular uh, yak plasmids and they will be used as a selection marker. So, these are the two uh, uh, genes which are going to be synthesized for tryptophan biosynthesis as well as for the uracil biosynthesis and you have the, uh, you, you have the uh, ability or you have the choices to use tryptophan or as well as the uracil deficient media to select the, uh, the transformed cells. Now, we will move on to the another plasmid that is called as the baculovirus uh, plasmids. So, baculovirus is a virus which actually uh, uh, infects the invertebrates including the yeast. So, baculovirus is a rod shaped virus which actually interfect the invertebrates including the yeast cells. Post infection, the virus is either released as a free virion or many virus particles are trapped in a protein complex known as the polyhedron or polyhedron. The protein responsible for trapping virus into the polyhedron is called as the polyhedron and it helps in transmission of virus from one host to another. 
So, this means the virus is actually synthesizing a protein which is called as the polyhydrin and this polyhydrin's job is to accumulate or to uh, protect the viruses from or trap the viruses to so that they will be uh, get transmitted uh, to another host. And the polyhydrin is not important for virus propagation, but it is under uh, under very strong promoter to produce the protein in large quantities. So, this particular protein is only required for the transmission of this particular viruses from one host to another, but this particular protein is not essential for the virus propagation. And, and but this protein is being produced from the viruses in a very uh, large quantity because it is under a strong promoter. Realizing this, what people have done is they have taken this particular uh, protein and what they have done is they have replaced a large chunk of this protein with the cloning cassettes. So, what they have done is the polyhydrin gene is replaced with a foreign DNA which allow expression of protein in a large quantity. So, you can imagine that if this is the cassette of the polyhydrin gene, what you, if, you, if you remove this particular cassette along with the foreign DNA, the virus is going to produce this protein in a large number, large quantities. And because of that, the people have developed the virus, uh, the, developed the, uh, the uh, plasmids or the vector which is called as the uh, so, they have taken out this particular gene from the Autographa California multiple ACMNPV and it is being used as a vector to express the proteins. Uh, the gene of interest will be inserted into the cloning site adjacent to the promoter site. So, this is the cloning site where you can put your foreign DNA, this is the promoter site, this is the termination site. So, uh, once you do that, uh, it so it also has the uh, polyhedron termination sequences downstream to the cloning to stop the transcription and uh, once you put that, it is actually going to produce the foreign DNA and it will going to produce that particular protein. Uh, instead of the polyhedron. So, that is how you can use this particular plasmid or this particular type of vector to infect the insect cells and the insect cells will going to produce the protein in large quantities. Now, we will come back to the mammalian vectors. So, the mammalian vector, there are large ex number of excellent mammalian vectors in circulations for protein synthesis as well as to study the transcription mechanisms, uh, uh, mostly the mammalian vectors are all going to contain the origin of replication from the uh, from the animal viruses such as the SV40 uh, or the simian virus 40. Uh, then it also contains the promoter to derive the uh, derive the expression of a foreign gene, which is this and. Uh, it also contains the origin of replication for the E. coli, it also contains the origin of replication from SC40 and the it also contains all other features such as polyadenylation sites, uh, transcription termination sites and all that. And this is the multiple cloning site, so you can actually express or replace your uh, gene into this multiple cloning sites, the promoter is present next to that and that is how you are going to you can be able to use this for producing the protein. Uh, you have the ampicillin resistance as well as the, uh, so that that's how you can use the mammalian expression vector for cloning purposes. Now, we will talk about the bacteriophage lambda based uh, vectors. So, bacteriophage are the virus, virus using bacteria as their host for replication. Bacteriophage lambda is the virus of E. coli and has been in used for developing the vector for genetic engineering. Before get into the detail of how it has been used for molecular cloning or uh, the, the developed for uh, expression of the protein into the host strain, let us go with the biology of bacteriophage plasmids. So, phage genome is a 
linear double standard DNA of 48.5 kilo bars per DNA. Uh, in both the ends of genome, it has a stretch of 12 nucleotide, uh, 12 nucleotide which are called as the complementary to each other. These sites are known as the cos sites. So, what you have is the genome and on the corner of the genome, you have the 12 nucleotide long chain which is actually complementary to each other. So, because of that what will happen is if you put them together these two sites will come and will eat will stick to each other. Because of that these things are called as the cos sites uh, and it allows as I said it allows the circulation of virus genome after entering into the host cells. So, what will happen is the virus will enter into the host as a linear DNA and then once it enter into the host the cos sites are being exposed and these cos sites recircularizes the genome and the genes are being arranged between these two cos sites or the cohesive sites and it codes for the protein which are responsible for making the head, making the tail you have the uh, gene which are required for integration and as well as recombinations, the genes which are regulating the immune system of the host, then you have the gene which are required for DNA synthesis and so on and factors for recombination and the process of lysogeny. Okay. The central region of the genome which is this portion is, uh, is non-essential and uh, can be replaced without much affecting the growth and the infectivity of the virus. As a result, this particular region can be exploited to develop a cloning vector. Now, let us see how the uh, genome is packed into the virus. So, far genome is replicated by a rolling circle model to produce the long genome whereas cord sites are present on the regular intervals. So, what will happen is the virus is uh, using the Rolly circling model and that is how it is producing the large uh, linear DNA or linear DNA which contains the cord sites on regular intervals and these cord sites just next to the cord sites are. Uh, so, you have two flanking cord sites and the DNA between them are constituting the two virus genome. So, this is the virus genome or one monomeric unit. In the presence of head precursors, so once the uh, head proteins are being synthesized, the long genome is being cleaved at the cos sites and encapsulated. Nicks are being introduced and at the both strand of the genome to generate the linear strand to uh, work as a cohesive site to facilitate the circularization. Uh, once this genome is inserted and the uh, head is being synthesized, the NIC is being generated onto the virus uh, cohesive ends uh, and the cohesive ends come together and the genome is being circularized. Then you, uh, then the assembly protein as well as all other protein comes and then the, the, the mature virus particle is being produced. Now, taking this into the account, the people have developed the bacteriophage lambda based vectors. So, how the vector works is that it has the two BAMH1 site which can be used to insert the foreign DNA. So, you can imagine that you have the two scenarios. In one scenario, what you have done is, so under the normal circumstances, what you have is you have the uh, insertion or excision region which is being in which is being inserted between the these two cos sites okay in the in the vector so as long as these sites are present it will integrate along with the host and it will not going to create any plaque formation instead it is going to go through with the lysogeny cycles but once you insert the foreign dna which you have taken out from the host okay and once you produce this foreign DNA and uh, inserted that into the uh, uh, T4 uh, into the bacteriophage lambda based vector, what will happen is you are going to lose the I by E region, which means 
this particular type of uh, uh, virus is not going to integrate or will not going to uh, uh, perform the lysogeny cycles. Instead, it will go through the, the lytic cycle and once it get, go through with the lytic cycle, it is going to generate the plaques and these plaques formation can be identified simply by looking at the cell under the microscope and that is how this actually plaque formation is the selection pressure or selection criteria when you use the bacteriophage lambda based vector. Some uh, two classical example are AMBL3 and AMBL4. So, these are the AMBL3 vector where you have this is the left cohesive sites, this is the right cohesive site and within this you have this central shutter portion which you can use for re uh, replace this along with the foreign DNA and can be used for cloning purposes. Similarly, you have the EMBL4 which can be used uh, under the similar conditions and so with this uh, we have completed our discussion about the different types of vectors which are being found. Uh, uh, and which are available for cloning uh, cloning purposes and uh, what we have discussed so far we have discussed about the plasmids which are being used in the bacterial uh, uh, host and the plasmids could be exist in multiple forms either it would be closed circular forms or open circular form or the supercoiled DNA. We have also discussed about the uh, how to generate or how to design a new plasmids uh, and use that for the cloning purposes. And apart from the plasmids, we have also discussed about the yeast, uh, uh, yeast vectors, we have also discussed about the bacteriophage lambda vectors, we have also discussed about the, um, the vectors which you can use to overexpress the protein in the insect cells and then at the end we have also discussed about the bacteriophage lambda based vectors which you can use for the uh, producing the protein or the transforming the cells in the host uh, for the, for the uh, mammalian systems. And with this we would like to conclude our lecture here and in the subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the entry of the recombinant DNA into the host. What we are going to discuss in the next lecture is that how to generate the recombinant DNA and then how to transform or how to insert this recombinant DNA into the host cells. We will discuss about the prokaryotic the methods which are popular into the, into the prokaryotic system as well as the eukaryotic system. So, with this we would like to conclude our lecture here. Thank you.